I'll we'll start off in 1 Kings 18. Uh, it will be kind of a lengthy reading, uh, so bear with me. Uh, we've, we've, most of us have probably heard the story about Elijah and the prophets of Baal, right? But I want to go over, sometimes what happens is we hear these same stories so much that we forget to listen, we forget to really look into it. And so I want to go dive into it tonight. Um, I, I was sitting in the shower today, and listen, that's where I do my best thinking, because I'm alone. Uh, anybody that has three crazy kids understands exactly what I'm saying. Um, some people, it might be the closet, like we see on the internet, where the mom's hiding in the closet eating the Twizzlers, and the kid's hands are coming up underneath. and like, Mommy, I want some. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying. But I, I was in the shower, and I was really praying. I'm like, okay, God, you know, what? Wh- where am I going? You know, I, I had so many thoughts leading up to this, and, and Miss Cheryl kept texting me, David, are you going to send me your notes? David, are you going to send me your notes? And finally, I just sent her three scriptures, and I said, listen, I promise you I'll stay in the parameters of these three scriptures. I said, just put these up, and we're going to get there. I said, I didn't want to get hemmed in because I had so many thoughts on where I was going to go. But as I said in the shower, I began to think about the flood and, and everything that's happened since I've gotten to the little country church. And, and it's been a lot. You know, I mean, we've seen how many, four or five floods? You know, six floods, uh, if you include the last one that went into the church. And um, it's been crazy. And, I, and I've kind of just thought to myself, and, and what I really began to think about was you guys. And this is what I mean. I mean. When I came, I had barely enough to fill up an F-250. Barely. I filled it up best I could. And I drove to Texas with my pregnant wife. And I said, all right, Lord, if you want me to, I'll go. And, and I felt like this was a place that was going to receive me and my wife well. And, and so when the first flood came, you know, I was like, dang, this, this is terrible. This is what people endure. But then I begin to think about it. And then the second flood happened. And Joseph's had his house flooded now like twice or three times. And, and shops flooded. And pastors had his house. And, and I really begin to think about it from the perspective of when I came, I had, like I said, an F-250 full of stuff. That's it. I had a car and a truck, and, and I thought, man, I ain't got nothing. And then I met y'all. And listen, this is the one thing I thought of today. Because of you guys, my family is stronger because of the relationships I have with you. My family is better because of the giftings and the, and the blessings you guys have been to my family. And then my family's wiser because of the wisdom that we've been able to inherit from you guys. Whether it's one-on-one or just watching. Sometimes the best lessons you'll learn in life are by simply watching others. How are they successful in that? And I watch people and I say, okay, that's what I want to implement. And that's what I want to partake of in my life. So what do I do? I I watch. I I look. And so I just want to say thank you because when the flood came, I actually had something that could get flooded. And that's because of you guys. So thank you for giving me stuff that could flood. Amen? I'm grateful for it. I really am. I I thought about it today. I thought, man, I wouldn't even have nothing in that shed if it wasn't for the people of a little country church. So you know what? Thank you. Because it could be worse. I could still have as much as I had an F-250 and be (laughs) with a wife with three kids. Maybe not. Y'all help me with that. That's, that's all y'all, okay? Just so you say. Just, that's all y'all. <laughs> anyway, I am, I am really excited. Like I said, my, my notes were everywhere. My mind was everywhere. And I said, okay, how do, how do I really want to go about tonight? How do I, how do I want to give information to the people so that we can learn? So, and, and I say we because, man, I, every time, you know, pastor always says he preaches to himself, and, and, and I agree. You have to, as a communicator of the gospel, man, this thing has to be inside of you before you can give it to anybody else. A mama bird can't give that baby bird unless she gets some herself, and then she can give to the baby bird, right? And and that's what I feel like every minister, everybody that's going to speak behind any pulpit should always do. It should be inside of you before you give it to the people. You can't export what you've never imported. And so if I hadn't put this into my life and I hadn't seen this through my own eyes and through my own perspective, and it, it ain't going to bless you. And so this is just from, from my perspective. This is from my life tonight. Uh, Pastor, if you're watching, we love you. Uh, I know you told me to greet the people, and, and, and guys, he loves you. 
He was he was sitting on the on a pier, a fishing pier, and he's like, "David, look at this." And I'm like, "I'm like, yeah, that's where I came from." You know, I'm looking over the Pacific Ocean, and I'm looking. I'm like, "That was my childhood right there. That's where I went whenever I didn't have Galveston. I had San Francisco and and Half Moon Bay. You know, and and so he's like, "Man, this is incredible." And he's like, "The cliffs and the sequoias are like right next to each other in the ocean." And I was like, yeah, that's where I grew up, and thank God I'm not there anymore. <laughs> Enjoy your stay. Don't let them know I'm out here, okay? <laughs> I'm staying. They ain't getting me back. But uh, we love you, Pastor. I'm grateful to be here tonight. I'm grateful that you, uh, like Joseph said, trust me to communicate a word to your people. As a shepherd, you don't leave your sheep with anybody. And, and your pastor trusts me and Joseph enough that... That we could get up here and communicate the gospel in such a way that he knows you guys will be safe, looked after, and taught. That's important. So tonight I want to start in uh, it's 1 Kings 18, and it's verse 16, and it says this. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. It says, and when he saw Elijah, he said to him, is that you, troublemaker of Israel? He said, I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have been abandoned the Lord's commandment and you have followed the Baals. Listen, if you ever get around someone that's blaming, it's probably because it's their fault. Just saying. It's biblical. It comes up a lot. If they start blaming, oh, well, it was, uh, 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 listen, that's probably the guy <laughs> in your life. He said, so Ahab, he's, he's trying to find his way out. He's like, no, 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 it wasn't me. It says, no, summon the people from all of Israel to meet on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Now, Jezebel is Ahab's wife. It says, so Ahab sent word throughout all of Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is your God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. Now listen, if you notice through the Bible, it's, it tends to repeat itself a lot in the Old Testament. And here's what I'm saying. Joshua 24 says the same thing. He said, listen. Joshua stands before the people of Israel and he says, look, y'all can follow whoever you want as your God. He said, but as for me and my household, we're going to follow the one true God. Yeah. And here's Elijah standing up again, having to remind the people a couple hundred years later. Listen, guys, y'all done fell away again. God's bring me here to remind you he's the one true God. So it says, so... Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450. Get two bowls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood. But do not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bowl and I will put it on the wood, but I will not set fire to mine. It says, then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire, he is God. Then all the prophets said, what you say is good. So basically they said, yeah, 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 this is good. We'll work this out. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first. Since there are so many of you, call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull, given them, and prepared it. It says, then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal answer us. It says, they shouted, but there was no response. No one answered. They danced around the altar that they had made. And at noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Listen, there ain't nothing worse than that. And you think you out there doing the right thing. <laughs> and the dude that's sitting on the other side make fun of you, okay? Now, he's laughing at them. He's making fun of them. He says, it says, shout louder. That's what Elijah began to say to him. He said, surely he is a God. Perhaps he is in deep thought or busy traveling. Maybe he is sleeping. And he must be awakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears. And their custom until the blood flowed. Listen, this is, this is it's starting to get weird, okay? So we got to remember that when this is taking place, they're on Mount Carmel. So they're up in a high altitude. 
Not only are they on Mount Carmel, but it says that all of Israel gathered. So Ahab, the king, he tells Israel, okay, look, everybody gather. We're getting ready to have a showdown. So they get up on top of the mountain. And, and, and this, this version is a little nicer. Uh, Elijah actually starts to make fun of them and, and says, uh, maybe your God is on the toilet. That's what one translation says. So he's, he's making fun of them, right? And so they know, okay, we, we better get serious. It says that they begin to cut themselves until the blood flowed. It, it's getting serious. This is getting weird. So to, to feel it, just to kind of fill you guys in real quick, it says, it says that they, they kept doing it, they kept doing it, and finally, Elijah said enough. You guys have had all day, hours and hours and hours. Y'all probably getting weak from the lack of blood that you got in your body right now anyway. He said, all right, listen, I'm going to go. He steps up, and when he steps up, he says, fill up four jars of water. Now, in their time, a, a jar wasn't like a mason jar. Like, they jars was like big jars, okay? So they fill up these four clay pots. And, they, and he says, okay, go ahead and throw it all over it. So not only, not only has Elijah made fun of them the whole time, but now he's adding a little bit of salt on the, the wounds that they've created for themselves. And he says, listen, fill it up with water. I want you to drench it. I'm going to show you what a true God looks like. And so he puts God on display. First of all, it was a man of faith, right? I mean, this is like, okay, <laughs> it's not just about, God, if you're going to answer me, it's like, look, Lord, I want you to show out tonight because all of Israel's here and they have forgotten your name. So Elijah's saying, look, we're going to show out tonight. So he says, fill up four large jars with water, pour it on the offering and on the wood. It says, do it again, he said. So now it's eight jars of water. He said, do it a third time. Now it's 12 bottle jars of water. It says, then the water ran down around the altar, even filled up the trench that they had around it. And at the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Israel, let it be known today that you are the God of Israel and that I am your servant and you have done all these things at your command. And answer me, Lord. Answer me so that these people will know that you are the Lord and you are God and that they are turning their hearts back again. And it says, then the, Lord, the fire of the Lord fell and it burned up the sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the soil and also licked up the water in the trench. Look, this wasn't just a fire. I don't know how many fires y'all seen that burned a stone up. I ain't never seen one. What do we do in Texas? We put stones around the fire to keep the fire from going out, right? That wouldn't have worked on this fire. <laughs> Done burned up everything. And so he's, again, he's showing out. It says, then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice. And when all the people saw this, it says that they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Then Elijah commanded them, seize the prophets of Baal and do not let one of them get away. And Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley. And they slaughtered them there. In our lives, so many times, what happens is we don't kill all the prophets in our lives. We let one of them go, two of them go, three of them go. Ah, that's, that's not a big deal. That's not a real big deal. And the Bible talks about the little foxes. It's the little foxes that ruin the vine. What does that mean? It's the little compromises in our lives that if we're not careful and we don't kill all them prophets of Baal, then what happens? They're going to come back and they're going to come back and they're going to keep coming back until we're willing to kill the prophets in our lives. Here's an example. The New Testament, Peter and James and John, right? So as they go, they go out pretty soon, Peter denies Christ. What's the next thing that they show? Peter, James, and John. The one thing that they left? Fishing. Where'd they go straight back to? We fishing. <laughs> Why? Because they didn't burn it up before they left. They knew what Christ said before he went to the cross. And yet the one thing they went back to was the fishing boat. But here's, here's a better example. Elisha, he comes up after Elijah. Now, this is how you know Elisha was a man after God's heart. Because it says that when Elijah came, and it says that he threw his cloak onto Elijah, onto Elisha, it says that he was plowing. So he, here's his job. 
plowing for daddy, probably, because that's what they did back in the time. Whatever daddy did, I did. So he's plowing. He's their farmers. Elisha's behind the plow, and Elisha says, give me a minute. I'll catch up to you. I mean, literally, this is all the Bible gives us a hint to. Elijah walks by him, throws his cloak on him, keeps on walking. And it's like, give me a minute. Why? Because it says that he took the plow and he made the, he made the offering and the sacrifice right there. He took the two bulls and he slaughtered them. And he fired them up right there because he said, I'm never coming back to this again. So many times in our lives, we always want to go back to the one thing that we had before we met, we met Christ, right? It was like all of a sudden God called. Listen, this for me, it was always construction. It was always trying to make money. I felt like, okay, I can do it on my own. If I'm not careful, I, I get to doing it on my own too much. And God have to remind me, David, you're right, God. I'm sorry. And so we have to be careful that we don't go back to the very thing that he called us from because it's the easiest thing to do because it's, it's what's comfortable. We always go back to what's comfortable. And so it, it goes on to say this. And so Elijah had this huge moment. They come down, they slaughter him in the valley, right? And so they had this mountaintop experience. And so in life, I want to talk to you guys about tonight. It's simply this. We trained for this. We had floods before. This isn't nothing new for us. We've trained for this. We've had issues in life and we've had hardships. We've trained for this. There are things in our lives that come every day that we've trained for. How? Just living. <laughs> Getting through one tough time so that we can get through another. And so I want to talk to you guys tonight. It says... Um, we were meant to climb. There are meant to be high points in our lives. There are meant to be places that we are striving for. There are meant to be places that are the pinnacle, right? Because those pinnacle times, that's like the birth of a grandchild. The birth for me and my wife, it was the birth of our three children. That was a high time. It was like, yes, this is amazing. But then what happens? That baby starts crying. Then that baby starts pooping. Then mama starts getting up in the middle of the night. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> she looked at me like, mm. he needed milk. I can't give him that. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> but no, reality is why we have these great, amazing times, right? So Elijah, he's up on the top of the mountain. He's like, yes. So where did he go back as soon as he was done in the mountain? He went to the valley. Why? Because life happens in the valley right? And the valley of life. It's our everyday life. We cannot sustain life at the top of a mountain. Why? Because it's not, it's not productive for us to be up there. When you look at a simple ge geographical map, where's all the green stuff? In the valleys. Where's all the life? In the valleys. Why? Because there's water there. Well, where there's water, there's floods. It's terrible, but it's part of life. It's part of what we live in in the Bayou City. We built around them, and then we get mad when they do what they're supposed to do. <laughs> Listen, this is life, and this is Houston life. This is Crosby life. This is New Caney life. But God has trained us for this very moment. Pastor always says something that, that the, the guy I came from in Oklahoma City, he said he's always preparing you for what he has prepared for you. So what am I being prepared for today? My tomorrow. What am I being prepared for my, my tomorrow? My next day and my next day. As so long as I'm on this earth, he's always trying to mature me. He's always trying to make me better so that I can get to the place he's called me to get. Okay. And so that when I get there, I can occupy the land that he's given me. If the children of Israel would not have understood what their purpose was, they would have got to the promised land, seen the giants, and be like, eh. man, yeah, those grapes look pretty good. That milk looks tasty, but never mind. Why? He had already showed them and prepared them. Why? Because he gave them battles, little battles, little battles, little battles. And what did that do? It strengthened them. And let them begin to realize, hey, okay, we can win this one. Okay, we can win this one. And then what did he do? He had to humble them because when he got to the city with the walls, Jericho, 
the first day, and it killed a bunch of them. Why? Because they did not do what he had told them to do. When they got to Ai, they went to attack it, and Ai whooped them. And they're like, whoa, God, I thought you said we was going to win these things. He said, I did, as long as you did what I told you to do. But when you go outside of my will, there's going to be casualties. There's going to be things that need to be cut off in your life because you're not listening. And so all of a sudden they realize, okay, we can't do this on our own. He's always going to give you something bigger than yourself so that you realize you have to rely on him. If your vision for your life can be done completely by you, it's not big enough. If you don't have to never rely on God again, listen, I promise you 1,000%. You're not living to the fullness that Christ has called you to because he's always wanting you to go outside of yourself just to get just enough uncomfortable so that he can grow you. If you never get uncomfortable, you'll never grow. That's a reality. If you're weightlifting and all you ever do is just enough to, okay, yep. (laughs) How how much are you going to grow? Here's a better one. If all I ever do is just pick this up just enough to feel like I read it today. How much are you growing? How much of a sacrifice are you making? How much can God grow your intellect of him so that when those trials come, he can pull it out of you? He can show you you're more than enough. Yeah, we can quote the scripture. I'm more than a conqueror until the flood comes and I see the water at my doorstep. And I start to say, God, where are you? Hey, are you listening? Are you sleeping? (laughs) All of a sudden, I'm going to start saying, why? Because in that moment, I'm saying, okay, God, wait. I'm not remembering my yesterday. I'm not remembering all the victories you've already taken me through. I'm not remembering all the things that you've already showed me. That's what everyday life does for me. Everyday life grows me. It seems mundane at times. But that valley living is where the growth happens. It's where the hardships happen. So that when I get to those wonderful times, I remember, oh yeah, God, you're good. So that when I get to that next valley of my life, I realize, man, this is tough. But man, remember when my baby was born? Remember when I didn't have groceries and all of a sudden I looked out on the porch And there was groceries when I couldn't make rent. And all of a sudden, somebody gave me a handshake, had a hundred dollar bill in it. And all of a sudden I could when I couldn't do something. But all of a sudden, God answered my prayer. And there it was. The answer laid right before me. Those are the everyday things that make me stronger, that make me more mature, that make me more like Christ. Because I'm always to be moving forward. Like Pastor Kenneth said, I thought that was great. He said, I'm either getting up or I'm up. (laughs) That's it. I ain't down. I ain't never down. I'm getting up or I'm up. That's that's all you get. And, And that's how everyday belief in Christ should be. I ain't no Christian, but I'm working on it. I'm getting up. When I feel like the devil knocked me down, all right, you're right. I missed it. But what am I doing? I'm running after him again. And I'm getting up. That's why in Micah it says that woe to you, my enemy. Listen, you can't hold me down. Though I fall seven times, do not make fun of me because I'm rising again. I'm rising again. This church is rising again. This church will not stay down. Why? Because the Lord himself is going to see us through. How does he see us through? By you, by me, by us putting our hands to the plow and getting it back. The Lord will never put something in your lap. Why? Because you'll never get stronger for it. See, so many times we're going to pray this prayer. Lord, if you would just give me. And he says, listen, you don't understand. I already did. You're just not willing to work for it. You're just not willing to go after it the way I intended you to so that you could get stronger, so that you could be ready because I know what your tomorrow looks like. You don't, but I know what your tomorrow looks like. So I need to get you ready today because I see into your future. I see what you're going to have to face tomorrow. It's not as pretty as you would like. And then all of a sudden, I thought it was supposed to be perfect when I got saved. And that's when you see the flies start dropping off. And I say flies nicely. Love you. 
but it's the truth. Because so many times, these people, they get saved, and it's like the littlest, the smallest thing, the smallest thing. I've heard so many times, oh, I can't believe. Really? Really? We're mature believers, and we're still getting tripped up on that? Really? But we're all human, and we all have our struggles. And so I try not to judge. Because, listen, I can probably get caught up on some stupid stuff, too. But, that's it. Please don't let stupid things offend you. I mean it. If love is to cover a multitude of sins, don't let those silly things offend you. So, listen, I want to get into this next verse. It's, it's one of my favorite verses. So, life occurs naturally in the valley, right? We got water. We got sustained growth. It, if I live in the valley or not, there's going to be food. If I live in the valley or not, there's going to be animals. If I live in the valley or not, why? Because there's water, because there's air, because there's, that's how it works. That's how the world works. Why do elk live in the deepest, darkest? Why? Because there's food and there's shelter. And that's exactly what happens in the valley of life. There's food and there's shelter in the valley. But without those high times, that repenting, that's what the Bible says. It says to go back to the high place. What's the high place? Jesus. That's simple. We go straight back to Jesus, and all of a sudden we realize, okay, you're right. My perspective was wrong. I had the wrong, I was thinking through my own eyes. Why? Because the Bible says, lean, don't, don't go by what you see, but by faith, right? Because the opposite of faith is what I see. It's, it's not necessarily fear. It's, it's what I see. That's why I don't walk by sight. I walk by faith. Because if I see something, then I get scared. If I'm walking and I see a bear, I'm scared. If I'm walking and I don't see a bear, it's not going to scare me, right? I can keep on. All of a sudden, bear jump. Now I'm scared. My ears start to work. It's dark. I'll never forget one of the scariest times of my life. I was walking through the woods in the middle of the night. I'm talking about dark, like dark, dark. And I'm walking and all of a sudden I hear noise. That blew my mind. It was outside of my scope of understanding. And I'm like, okay, Bigfoot literally exists. He's got to be, he's got to be right in front of me, right? And so all of a sudden, and I didn't have no flashlight on, I'm running. I normally don't do this, but I'm telling you, again, it was outside of my scope of understanding. So I'm like, okay, there's something straight up crazy out there in the woods right now. I get back to the truck, flip the lights on. It was a donkey. <laughs> a donkey. First of all, what in the world is a donkey doing out in the middle of the woods? Okay? But it scared the life out of me. I had never heard a noise like I heard from that donkey. It blew my mind. I, and I flipped the light on. Like, flip them off. Flip them off. Flip them off. You know, I had friends in the car. You know, now they laugh. Oh, that's funny. That, yeah, it was funny because y'all wouldn't go out in the woods by yourself like I was. It was funny. I jumped in that truck <laughs> through the window. Boom. Flip on the lights. Flip on the lights. Flipped on the light. Donkey standing there. <laughs> Why? Because I saw. I heard with my senses, with my natural senses, if I'm not careful, that is what's going to get me in trouble. When I lean on my own understanding, that's when I get in trouble. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways, all your ways, all your ways. Acknowledge me and I will make straight your path. Listen, if we're not careful in these times, we lean on our own understanding and we get the wrong perspective because we're getting a fleshly perspective. Why did God want them to get away from Baal? Because he was a fleshly God. Whatever felt good to your flesh that's what pleased Baal. They had big drunken parties. They had orgies. They had all these things. Why? Because it pleased themselves. So it pleased Baal. Really all it was was a, a God himself. It was a God of the flesh. And if we're not careful, we always run back to the flesh. He's a pig monster on our back. And if we're not careful, he will get right back on. And we will let him. That's the scary part. Okay. <laughs> I know how heavy you were last time. Jump on. Let's go. No, I'm saying let it die. So I want to get to this. It says, 
One of the servants said to Saul, one of Jesse's sons. Now this is Saul. He's having some issues. He's having trouble with, with some spirits, the Bible says. It says they were afflicting spirits. I don't know what that means uh, other than he was obviously afflicted. So it says that, that one of Jesse's sons from Bethlehem is a talented harp player. So he said he was looking for a harp player. He's looking for somebody to play some music to give him some relief from this afflicting spirit. It says, it says not only is he a harp player, but he is brave. He's a brave warrior. It says he's a man of war and he's good judgment. He's also a fine looking young man and the Lord is with him. This was, David was still gathering sheep. How did this man be able to look at David and be able to say all this? David hadn't won a single battle yet. David hadn't even gone up against Goliath yet. David hadn't done nothing as far as anybody was concerned. So how did this man that was sitting in the presence of the king know anything about him? Opportunity not. David had to respond. And he had to be everything this dude told him he was. Otherwise, the king was going to be like, nope, next. And so he began to be all these things. But somebody had to say it about him to bring it out of him. Sometimes in life, we need to listen to those voices that will bring out the best in us. Even if it's not what we want to hear at times, we have to listen to those voices in our life that really speak into us, that say, listen, you could be better. You could be all of these things, David. You're not just a shepherd, but you've been honing your skills, and I'm getting ready to put them on display. And that's what he was saying. It says, and so I want to talk to you guys about opportunity. It says the Chinese symbol for crisis is the same as the symbol for opportunity. So crisis is the same symbol for opportunity. Why? Because every crisis, you have an opportunity. You have an opportunity to fold. You have an opportunity to recess or regress. Or you have an opportunity to make the most of it and become stronger. That's all this is. This is just another thing that we have to overcome. This is just another thing that's going to strengthen us. This is just another thing to get us ready for our future. God must have a pretty bright future for us in order for us to be, build our foundation the way he is. Amen. It says, opportunity is not enough to make you a success. How many, how many in here can raise their hand at this? I've had opportunities and I missed them. <laughs> right? Because opportunity in and of itself is not enough to make me successful. Here's an example. I could be five foot six. Could be. Thank God I'm not. If you are, praise God. Amen. <laughs> you can fit into smaller things than I can. Uh, I could have the opportunity to go play in the NBA. Could. I could have the opportunity to go play in the NBA. I didn't have to dribble. I'd have to know how. But I could, I could not know how to dribble. I could not know how to pass. I could not know the rules. Am I going to stay long in that opportunity? No. Right? Because preparation is what makes every opportunity a success. Therefore, that's what makes me a success. Preparation time is never wasted time. Look, God is always preparing you. He is always, if it's not for anything even on this earth, it's for this. We're going to spend forever with him one day. And he wants us to look as much like him as we can. And even if it's just preparing me for my future with the king, then that's what I need to be preparing for. And so, Opportunity in and of itself will never make me a success. I also said this. Opportunity is only seized in preparation. has gone before it. I'll never be able to occupy or to be able to achieve what God has called me to achieve if I don't prepare for it. My today determines my tomorrow. And if I have not prepared today, my tomorrow is going to look exactly the same. It's going to look exactly the same. So what do I do? I said this too. And this was something that I just began to think about that really just kind of got me. Opportunity has the ability to propel me, or to slingshot me, to move me ahead, or it has the opportunity to anchor me. And this is what I mean by that. 
How many times have we missed an opportunity, knew, oh, this is a great opportunity. Preparation wasn't there, missed the opportunity. Now I spend the next five years thinking about that opportunity I missed. Instead of preparing for my next opportunity and recognizing, okay, what can I learn from the one I just missed? What can I learn from the thing I just missed out on? What is it? Okay, Lord, let me learn that. Israelites didn't do it. Forty years in the desert, kept going around the same mountain, just walking. Man, that'd get boring. I like, hey, didn't didn't we pass this last month? Mm. <laughs> Guess so, <laughs> right? I mean, for forty years, it says that they walked around the same place. I'm like, hey, wait, wasn't that my sandal that I left there? Oh. It, because it says that their sandals never wore out in that 40 years. Their clothes never wore out in those 40 years. But that's another story. <laughs> Just make sure y'all was reading, you know. Listen, we strengthen one another. Our opportunities always lead to other people. My opportunity never came because I was so great. Because it always came through somebody else. That's why pastors always talking about relationships as a currency of the kingdom. Why? Because listen, I promise you, there's never been an opportunity that you created on your own. Never been. It was always because somebody else saw something in you because you applied for a job that somebody else told you about. Very, very rare, I will say this, that I had something because I just went out and got it. Nobody said nothing. I just stumbled over the paper. And I, pfft, looky there. God told me. Maybe. But the reality is life happens through friendships. Life happens through the fact that j told me about this. And I went over there. And then all of a sudden that dominoed into this. And then I went over here. And then that dominoed. It, it, life is a progression of meetings. It's a progression of, of, okay, you were in my life and you taught me this. And now, and we can even say that about exes, thank God for them. Why? Because they made me the person I am today. My wife says that I'm a better husband because of them. Maybe. <laughs> Some of them I could have went without. <laughs> thank you, Lord. <laughs> but, but the reality is that's truth, right? It's a progression of meetings with people. And through those meetings, it shapes me. It cuts on me. It helps me. Some, some were, were happen chance. Walk through the store. God created a divine appointment, met a guy. That guy told me about this guy. That guy told me about this guy. All of a sudden, I'm somewhere that I never, it wasn't even near where I was going, but because of divine appointments, God set me up to get to the place that I'm at. How did God get me to Texas? <coughs> through the same thing. Through a, through a happen chance meeting with Bishop Tony Miller, I just said, look, I, I, need, to, I need to talk to you. And I had been in the church for a couple of years. I was sitting in the back. I, I got involved with the youth a little bit. And then I was like, look, I'm, I'm really trying to figure out where I want to do next. And he said, man, I want you to come serve me. Uh, doesn't pay too good. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, I got you. Uh, Lord, you got me? Like, cause that's not real good. But then he said, look, I got you. And I said, okay, look, I'll go. I'll serve. And through that servanthood and through that time, not only did he prepare me, but he was setting me up. He was getting me ready to go to the little country church. He was getting me ready for the next stage of my life. But I didn't see it then. All I could see was I wasn't getting paid very much. All I could see was $160 a week, and I still had all my bills. How does that work? I don't know. It was like the ravens feeding Elijah. I promise you. It was like $5 here, $10 here. It was like, okay, God, I really don't know how we're going to make this. And all of a sudden, car payment got paid here. I don't know how that happened, but okay, thank you, Lord. Cheeseburger here, cheeseburger there. Like, I just felt like this, is, this was really a raving time in my life, but I kept listening. And I was like, okay, God. So we know that we have to make the best of our opportunities. But our, our, our opportunities only come through meeting people. And, so, uh, and it says, let us not neglect our meetings together so that some people do, as some people do. It says, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. It's more important today than it was yesterday to meet with each other. I need you guys more today than I've ever needed you. Your pastor needs you more today than he's ever needed you. Your brothers, your sisters need you more today than they've ever needed you. Believer or unbeliever, listen. 
Some of us work in jobs where we actually get to hang out with unbelievers. I don't. I work with guys that are probably better at, at life than I am. But that's okay. So I'm working it out. But the truth is, what am I doing? I, I don't get the opportunity to give my life away like some of you guys do. You guys get to be an example. You guys get to be salt and light wherever you go. I can go to Walmart. And listen, you ask my wife, I talk to everybody at Walmart. I talk to the greeter. I talk to the person at the cash register. I talk to the weird kid walking down the hall looking strange. Hey. <laughs> Giving me the crazy soft eyes. Uh, it doesn't matter. I just want to talk to people. Why? Because I know I have something inside of me that they need. Don't let us neglect the fact that we can come together. It strengthens us. How do we get strengthened? It says Iron sharpens iron. Unless we can get around each other, yeah, sometimes we cut on each other. Good. Sometimes we cut on each other bad. But the truth is, it's all shaping us. It's all helping us. It's all moving us forward to do what Christ has called us to do and to have those happen chance meetings. I can't tell you how many times I've tried to network in this church. I try to get people to network. Why? Because I know that the next big thing hinges on the relationship I have. The next thing in my life hinges on one of the relationships I have right now. Why? Because that's how life works. So let us not to forget the fact that we can meet with one another. Whether it be corporate, as a church, or whether it be one-on-one. -on -one. Listen, we got to do that more. We have to call H. What are you doing today, man? Let's do lunch. Daniel, what are you doing today? Let's do lunch. He's going, to, that's right. Go Astros. <laughs> Tomorrow, Friday. Friday at 1, which I still, um, guys, this is, why would you have a playoff game at 1 o'clock? Just saying. So strange on a weekday. Supposedly, it's already been sold out. Go Astros. I won't be able to catch it. I'll be able to hit it on my phone, I guess. Still strange. But anyway, go Astros. Listen, in this time of our lives, not only do we have to meet with one another, we have to remember, we have to lift our pastor up. We have to remember, we have to lift our pastor up. And this is what I mean. It says, so Joshua did what Moses had commanded and fought the army of Amalek. Meanwhile, Moses, Aaron, and Hur climbed. Again, they're climbing to the top of a nearby hill. As long as Moses held up the staff in his hand, the Israelites had the advantage. But whenever he dropped his hand, the Amalekites gained the advantage. Moses' arm soon became so tired he could no longer hold them up. So Aaron and Hur found a stone for him to sit on. And they stood each side of Moses. Each side of Moses. Holding up his hands. So his hands may remain steady until sunset. As a result, Joshua overwhelmed the armies of the Amalekites. Listen, if we don't hold up our pastor's hands, first and foremost, there's going to be casualties. You've got to think about this. Every time that Moses let his staff down, it says that the Amalekites got the advantage. Listen, they didn't fight battles like we fight. They was face to face. So if you was losing, you was killing people. People were dying. Every time that staff fell. Guys, if we're not careful and we're not holding up the hand of our pastor, people are going to die. We're going to cut the wrong people. We're going to say the wrong thing. People are going to get offended. They will be dropping out of this church if we're not holding up the hand of our pastor. What do I mean by that? When you hear something, don't telephone that thing through the crowd. Don't keep it going. Squash it. One of the easiest ways to squash something about somebody else, listen, I, I give you, I promise you this works 1,000% of the time. Dick, listen, thank you, sir. This works 1,000% of the time. When you hear somebody start to jabber about somebody else, simply grab them by the hand. Take them straight to that person and say, hey, this person wanted to tell you something. I promise you, 1,000% of the time, every time, they're going to say, I, I, I didn't want to say nothing. 
No, we was just, we was just talking about, oh, no, 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 he misunderstood what I was saying. Listen, that's how you squash stuff. Don't, don't be the person that continues an offense. Be the person that squashes it. That's holding up your pastor's hand. When there's a work day, show up if you can. Listen, we know everybody can't show up. There's life that has to still happen. We get that. But if there's a work day, show up. That, that holds the hand of your pastor up. When he doesn't feel like he has to hold this thing by himself, when there's others around him, that's holding the hand of your pastor up. When he doesn't have to bear every single decision, listen, in your life, you don't have to run to him every time there's a little problem. That's what we're here for. That's what the connection groups are for. Why? So that when I have a problem, I don't have to be like, hey, pastor, uh, man, you know, stub my toe in the shower today. Uh, you pray for me? Come on. Listen, I'm not getting on to you if you do that. But I am saying, look, make some friends so you can call them. Make some friends. So I'm be like, hey, H, man, you know, I'm struggling with this today. Your pastor don't have to hear about all your struggles, but your brother can. Your brother can be there for you. Your sister can. Your sister can be there for you. That's how we build each other up. That's what the Bible says. We have to, we have to build each other up. That's through connections. I can't, I can't build up H if I don't know nothing about him. My, hey, H, uh, you want to go to a crochet meeting next month? You don't know H very well. <laughs> he might go. He's a good guy. He's a nice guy. He did be like, yeah, David, that's super weird, but all right. Like, uh, thank you for the invite. And then that day, he's going to be like, um, yeah, something came up. So listen. Let's be mature in this season. Last, last time there was a flood. Let's just be honest. People dropped out of the church. Why? They were offended. Some, and silly, silly, silly things. Here's the problem. Miscommunication. If you have a miscommunication, please be big enough. Go to that person. Find out if that's what they meant. 99% of the time, wasn't nothing that they meant. You heard through this person that heard through this person that heard through this person. We're seeing that in politics right now. Oh, there's a whistleblower. Nobody knows who the whistleblower is. Nobody knows the conversation. Nobody, but all of a sudden, let's get rid of our president. Why? Hearsay. Come on. We have to do better than that. As believers in Christ, let's be mature enough to understand we don't have to be offended. Do not be easily offended. That's what the Bible says. But woe to those who come through. Squash it. Lift up the hands of your pastor. Let's save some of those people that might easily get offended. We know we have brothers and sisters in the house that hadn't been here long. They're not, they're not all the way mature. But I can save him by just simply saying, dude, you know what? Shh. Squash that. That's nothing. He smelled funny when he came into church. Who cares? Seriously? Yeah, maybe he's working all day. You know? Heaven forbid somebody didn't get a shower before they came to church. But that's seriously why people leave. Like I'm telling you from stories that I've heard. Like we can do better. But not only that, when we lift up our pastor, when we love one another... The body grows and it's healthy. Listen, when you have a healthy body, they won't be a, a single place in this church missing. We're going to have to grab chairs every week. Because when there's love, people, they're going to run to it. It's a beacon of light in our community today. Look, at why, why do all these young people run to all these rallies and everything? Looking for love. That's all it is. Let the church be what the next generation's looking for. How do we do that? Loving them. Grabbing them exactly where they're at and telling them, look, you're a man of war. Just like that David's life. You can play the harp. You're incredible. 
You have giftings in your life that you haven't even explored yet, but you're getting ready. Call it out of people. Show them that there's more to life than just video games and chasing women. And we've all been there. Well, hopefully some of us, the other sex, haven't. But I'm saying. <laughs> Miss Marie's there. <laughs> Forget that last comment. Think about all the other good things I said. <laughs> No, but I'm serious. I know I joke a lot, guys, but it's for this. It's for the simple fact that we have to meet people where they're at. If we don't, I promise you, the world's going to pass the church by. The world will literally pass us by. And then God's going to say, man, you had an opportunity. You had an opportunity to squash something, and you kept it going. You had an opportunity to lift up your pastor's hand, and you let him fall. You had an opportunity to strengthen your brother. And you didn't. Why? And all you're going to be able to say is. I got in the way. Myself. It was me. And I know we're better than that. I know that we can lift up our pastor right now. In such a way. That not only will he come out of this thing. Thinking. Man we did good. But he's going to come out of this thing and he's going to say, dude, my church is healthy. My church is ready to rock. My church could take a city. Isn't that what we want? We want to affect the communities we're in. That's why we're here. Right? If we're not, then we're doing it wrong. I promise. But our pastor needs our help like never before. He needs his friends, his brothers, his sisters. So let's be that tonight. Amen. And going forward, let's pick up our pastor and let him know how much we love him and how great of a man we believe him to be. He's a man. He's going to make mistakes. Forgive him. Forgive him. Forgive me for making stupid comments. Don't leave the church. I'm just a youth pastor. Don't listen to me. <laughs> I love you guys. I'm so grateful to be able to stand before you tonight. But I hope you caught something. Let's help our pastor. Let's make the best of every opportunity we're given. And let's change our communities. And we can do that through love. Amen? Lord, I love you. I thank you. I pray that you would just be with everybody that heard me tonight. I pray that you be with everybody that was on the internet. Everybody that heard me now. Everybody that might even hear me in the future. I pray that this word would bless them, would touch them, would stir something in their hearts, Father God. One thing I love about what your word says, it says that you light the fire of the altar. A, what I mean by that is you light the fire in my life, but it's my job to maintain it. Lord, let me to be a man. Let everybody under the sound of my voice to be men and women that would maintain the fire of God in their lives. That it wouldn't dwindle down and get dim but instead it would be a mighty blaze so that everywhere they go they would recognize and understand that you are king of kings and lord of lords through my life let me to be an example and an ambassador to your kingdom that's a way that would cause people to be forever changed not because i said something great but simply because I have the love of Jesus Christ in my life. Because I am salty everywhere I go. Because I represent and I reflect you, my King. I love you, Lord. Be blessed tonight by what you heard in this place. Let your ears be pleased. Let your heart be pleased. And let our lives to be not for ourselves, my King. Let it to be for you, for your kingdom. And as we do such, I pray that you would overflow our lives with both monetary things and the good things of life, Lord. The sweetness of life that only you can give. I bless your holy name tonight. We praise you because we know lives will be changed. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. amen. Get your children, please.